Okay, so I want to introduce Monique, Monique Roffey. I, I, I usually call her more by her first name because I know Monique and Monique's been coming to the London Buddhist Centre for a while and we're going to talk about that at some point. But Monique has written six novels and a memoir. Her book, uh, The Mermaid of Black Conch, which we've got lots of copies in the bookshop, uh, it won the Costa Book of the Year and Costa Novel of the Year in 2020. So it's very, very exciting. I mean, there's a, there, I remember you sharing a picture of you the moment you found out that you won uh, Costa Book of the Year. And, you know, to, 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 that's a wonderful thing to, to read. And, and that book was also nominated for eight other awards. So here she is, Monique Roffey. Come and join us. <laughs> Very nice to have you on this side of the stage, Monique. Oh, well, I get some, thank you. I, w I was having a quiet moment there going, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> um, I'm also, um, when I do things um, in Trinidad, um, I always have, like, my mum sitting right there, <laughs> and now I've got my flatmate sitting right there. <laughs> 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 so um, it's really nice to be here. Really nice to have you. So I thought... I was, we were, when we were chatting beforehand, I, I said what I did with The Mermaid of Black Conscious, I just opened it and read the first paragraph. Because you can tell, you can often tell a lot, a lot can't you, about a novel. Just, you just need to read the first paragraph. I, I, I learnt this by, that's how I discovered Marilyn Robinson. Have you read Marilyn Robinson? You should have. Um, uh, I read the first paragraph of Gilead, and I, was, I thought, this is, a, this is wonderful, and I got it. And that's why I, I read the first paragraph of The Mermaid of Black Conch. So I thought we'd hear the first paragraph. Okay. David Baptiste dreads are grey and his body wizened to twigs of hard black coral. But there are still a few people around St Constance who remember him as a young man and his part in the events of 1976 when those white men came from Florida to fish for marlin and instead they pulled a mermaid out of the sea. It happened in April, after the leatherbacks had started to migrate. Some said she arrived with them. Others said they'd seen her before, those who fished far out. But most people agreed she would have never been caught at all if the two of them hadn't been carrying on some kind of flirty, flirty behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked flirty, flirty behaviour. Um, yeah, so the first thing that really struck me, Monique, about the novel is I slightly worried that there wouldn't be a mermaid in it. I thought, oh, it's going to be the mermaid, it's like a metaphor, you know, oh, yeah, no. somebody who... Oh, yeah, no, fish. Um, yeah, yeah. So how, where, how did you get to a mermaid? Um, well, um, so many years ago, um, I was in Tobago at the northern end, and um, there was, I was staying there with a friend, and there was a fishing competition, a yearly fishing competition, hmm where all these boats start gathering from all up the islands and Colombia and you name it. It's, a, it's quite an interesting thing to happen. And, mm. um, and uh, all men, and um, he was watching these boats go out every morning and then coming back with their fish and, you know, um, not necessarily catching and releasing, but they were hanging up these big fish. And at the end of this jetty, there's this kind of what looks like a gallows it's um, to hang the fish from, mm. and um, the last time they caught a really, really big marlin was 2013, mm. and there are photographs of this enormous, like, beast hung um, <clears throat> from the same gallows, and I just had this, <coughs> had a dream, ah, had a ah. dream about that they caught a mermaid. Ah. That's it. That's how it started. <laughs> yeah. What if, what if, you know, and I had that dream, for, like, kicking around for a very long time and um, and then like years later I just sort of started writing hmm. my mermaid story. Do you know why you had that dream? No. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, you know, mermaids are outsiders, hmm. you know, hmm. quintessential outsiders, cursed hmm. and stuck and women and young, hmm. all hmm. those things I get. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, 
I mean, I can say so much more about mermaids. I mean, I can t- I can talk say a bit more, more about mermaids, and we'll go on to something else. But mermaid, so. mermaids, mermaids. Because it, well, as I say, you know, I I thought oh, it's going to be a metaphor. You know, it's going to be yeah. she's called the mermaid. Well, she's a metaphor. She, she is, is a yeah. big walking yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. big metaphor for yeah. everything that is um, um, cursed and outside, and mm. um, she has been excluded and exiled and um, then violated and dominated and monetarized and so there's lots going on with the story mm. of what happens to her mm. and also um, even when she's dropped her tail um, she's dehumanized you know people won't but so there are people who are saying you know she's a fish she's still a fish mm. sell her you know and so she's struggling to pass as human she's it's there's something about um, first contact happening there again mm. we're, ha- we're having a moment where you know our indigenous people are washing up our history of washing up on our shore um, how would we take care of this kind of person mm. if we suddenly encountered an indigenous woman mm. and would she find herself in a similar situation if she was very pretty and young and talented mm. so mm. There's, there's, there's a lot going on with this, mm. this mermaid and all mermaids all mermaids mm. have got very similar stories about being cast out. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I mean, one of the striking things about the book is 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 how believable you make the mermaid. You know, um, you you describe her a lot and you, and, her, and all sorts of transformations. I don't want to sort of spoil things. You know, we need to do spoiler alerts for those online and for everybody else. But um, how was that like writing a, a believable mermaid? Did, was that um, well? It, because she's only she she stops being a mermaid and then she becomes a human again. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But she's still got something of her fishy self. Hmm. Um, well, uh, you know, you, I dreamt her up. I uh, did some research. I had to think. Um, I mean, there's. I wanted her to be um, very big. Hmm. Yeah, she's so very big. So I wanted her to be. As big as those marlin that you might pull out of the sea, and mm. they're like five, six hundred pounds. They're like a really big fish. Mm. You have to catch them with like a steel line, and there are amazing photographs you can find online of like somebody's got, you know, you need a bigger boat, mm. where you know the fish has taken the boat over, and you know men strap themselves into a chair to catch these big fish. Mm. You know, it's very. So when I thought about the dimensions of like this mermaid, she wasn't going to be a cute little sort of, you know with a little flippers, you know, she wasn't going to be like that. So I thought, okay, sh- I want her to be that big. Mm. So in fishermen's terms, they call a marlin that big a grander. Yeah. She's a grander. I wanted her to be grand, and then I thought, okay, if she's that big and she's been swimming around for like a 1,000, 2,000 years, what would, the, um, e- what would her energy be? Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever stood near a mountain. Near the mountains have these incredible... Mm. Like, you know, and sort of power places, you mm. know, stone circles. I wanted her to have that kind of magnetism so that when they are drag when they get her on the boat, they're like, oh my God, you know, mm. this is, mm. we've done something wrong. Mm. And she's too big for the boat, mm. blah, blah, blah. Mm. So, you know, drama. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> drama. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm all for drama. Drama. Um, the other, another thing that I wanted to talk to you about is, is it's a very strongly evoked sense of place in the novel. Mm. Um, that, again, it's one of the very striking things about it. A very strong sense of place. And uh, You were born in, born in the port of Spain, in Trinidad. I wonder whether you could say a little bit about your sense of place, you know, and, and your life. And we chatted when we met for coffee about your parents and mm. their history a little bit, you know, your place, because yeah. there you were <clears> in the port of Spain, you know, in Trinidad. Well, um, funny, I've just come back from Trinidad, um, who have been uh, surviving two years of COVID over there. Mm. Um, so I have a couple of Trini friends in the audience, actually, <laughs> nodding sagely. Um, well, so I'm metropolitan in my background in Trinidad. So, like, it, it's such a diverse place. Um, so, you know, I couldn't speak for the whole of Trinidad, but I can tell you my specific um, experience of like living near, the, near a city, mm. Um, mm. which is that it is kind of, I mean, I've just been reading another friend of mine's book, Ayana uh, Lloyd Banwo, she's writing about Port of Spain. I mean, 
we're now producing tons of writers, mostly women, and I, I would say almost half of our writers are writing about the city, maybe from different points of view. But um, so we, um, it's an old, where I come from is an old um, colonial city, but um, it is built on like, uh, like a swamp, as we would say, <laughs> with cotton trees and an old Amerindian uh, settlement. And so we have this big thing called the Red House, which is our big like colonial house of like power. And um, so just, just an example that not long ago they found mass graves under it mm. of, the Amer of Amerindians. Mm. Um, so it's a place of layering, mm. of historical um, layers of like mass crimes. Um, mm. <clears throat> so, you know, it's a place with a lot of um, uh, trauma. It's a traumatized space. It's mm. an ex-colonized space. Um, it's um, really artistic, um, and I think there's some of that in the book. So everywhere you go, we have a lot of fine artists mm. and writers, and we have so much to show for our creativity. Mm. Um, it's people we're known for our carnival, but um, we have like a big literary festival and a big film festival, and mm. so we're, we're big art producers, and um, so. Am I, I, don't, I think I'm going off the subject, but so for example, I have a friend called Che Lovelace, who's an artist, and I've been in the car with him driving around, and we're looking at the same, we're constantly talking to having this conversation about the same thing. He's painting what I'm writing about, mm. I'm writing what he's painting. Mm. So, and Naipaul was very um, honest about the fact that he just sort of plundered Trinidad. Mm. Like, it's like, you know, you, you could, you, you walk outside, you could just walk straight into a tree and, you know, the tree would shake and down would fall a novel. You know, mm -hmm. it is such a uh, layered, complex, diverse, fucked up, sorry, I could not say fucked up, uh, complicated place. Complicated, complicated yeah, that's where you go. So I think that, you know, if you're prone to um, wanting to make art and or write or make music, it, it's an incredible place to, to you're saturated in... Um, so many things that are butting into each other. Um, colonial architecture, um, wildness in the, in, the, in the hills that surround Port of Spain, um, instances of realism that Europeans might call magical realism. Mm. Just constantly, um, I mean, you'd have to be dead not to, not to kind of like sort of be in some way um, impressed. Mm. impressed Woken up. essentially yeah, um, yeah. by this place and it's not an innocent place and it's not a safe place either no of course of course i mean the other thing yeah, i wondered reading the novel was um the inf it's tri struck it really reminds me of derek walcott you know derek walcott is one of my favorite poets um you even i was thinking gosh this this whole world feels like derek walcott and then it, it, then, then his first book is mentioned. Well, he uh, lived in Trinidad and he uh, had a big theatre workshop there. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah, so yeah. he has a lot of, he has like one foot in Trinidad, really, and he's revered in Trinidad. Mm. He mentored quite a few actors and some some writers, yeah. Mm. I mean, he, th there's even the, the relationship between uh, Miss Rain and life um, felt like, I don't know whether you've read Another Life, which is, you know, one of, one of Walcott's book length poems. But there's a relationship between Walcott and this oh, woman God. who goes off to a nunnery, a convent, convent school, yeah. that's the word. Um, it, it felt like those two characters carry on that story. Wow. It's okay. very, it, was like, it was like you've read that poem. And then I have read it. Wrote no. there, I wrote have there, read there him, next but story. Not that, yeah. Right, yeah. No. Walcott. Walcott. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the best person to talk about Derek Walcott because, you know, he's a complicated man as well. Obviously, um, a magus and a genius mm. and a giant, and also other problems around him, the way he treated women mm. in his life mm. and mm. people he taught. Mm. So, you know, again, this, I'm a completely different generation mm. of mm. writer and... So there's so much to say to unpack about Wal Walcott from a kind of contemporary 21st century feminist. 
you think you were influenced by him? The novel um, influenced by him? No, I don't think I am. Don't right, know. Yeah. <laughs> I know that he, he is, I mean, so um, if you don't know anything about the Caribbean, we have two, two um, Nobel laureates. Um, one is Trinidadian, um, via Snipal, and then Walcott was from St. Lucia. And they are um, enormously influential. Um, uh, it's hard to even mm, yeah, summarise yeah, how yeah, big yeah, 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 their yeah. influence is yeah, yeah. on our, um, not just literary world, world, you know, world. Everybody can, everybody's read Nipple and everybody knows Walcott. They are literally, I don't know if this, uh, yeah, you have, we have big writers everywhere in the world mm, mm. and they are two, they come from a tiny place, you know, mm. and they didn't like each other. Um, no, no, they right. used to, so fame, fa- I can't believe I'm talking about David Derek Walcott. But um, so famous, they had terrible fights, and famously, um, Walcott wrote a poem about Naipaul and performed mm. this poem. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's not. I'm, I can't I'm a Buddhist. I come from a whole different world of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's. I've read him. Um, I've admired him. I've used his poetry in some of my books, back ended and front ended, and I mean, it's a bit like, it's he's he, he, they are overwhelmingly. Eponymous. It's like you can you can actually not read Walcott, and he would be an influence. Yes, of course. Yeah, I bet. That's yeah. how. Yeah, that's bet. how it's like. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, the other the other thing I wanted to mention is, it, you you say that you know it's a dangerous place, um, but reading um, Mermaid of Black Conch, what struck me is it felt like another Eden. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, even one of the characters is called called Arcadia. Um, David and the Mermaid had for me. I know it sounds a bit outraged, but it had a bit of Merm- uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah. First Cupid sex- and you know, Psyche a bit. Yeah, a bit reversed. of Cupid and Psyche. Yeah. Um, first sexual contact, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the discovery of uh, erotic love and so forth. Um, mm. There's even a kind of holy child. If you Who think. is? Reggie is a sort of kind of holy child, it struck me. I haven't think of that's a new one. Well, he's... <laughs> I've never I'm making it up. Um, <laughs> that's you read it. No, no, he is. He's, well, he's, 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 he's deaf. Well, I'll talk a, a bit about that in he's a moment. He's a magical... Yeah, he's a yeah. sort of magical child. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's prodigious. He, he's, he's quite clearly a, a prodigy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's very kind of... He's a silent figure in it, but, he, he, you know, he, he's... He, he's um, yeah. Yeah, he seems like a holy child. Well, anyway, well, so what about Eden? Well, again, there's a lot about um, indigenous culture and a time before the Spanish landed in the northern, the Greater Antilles, and killed everybody. So there's an attempt to try and think back to a place when, you know, before everybody arrived and killed everybody, and by everybody, I mean the Spanish and the British and the, all these people who came and took, 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 hurt everybody, enslaved, indentured, blah, 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 all of it, genocided people. That's what's been going on, mm. went on for hundreds of years. Mm. And I'm trying to think about what it might, what the footprint might have been for people who lived very peacefully there and in a very civilised way. Mm. And yeah, so there is an there is an endemic kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of heart, Harkening or yearning for that kind of innocent time, mm. yeah. Yes, it's there. Um, so I have hearing loss, and mm. so I was always going to write a deaf character. Mm. Um, you may remember me sitting in mm, the front, do, yeah. like lip reading for like years. Mm. Um, so I always thought I'm going to be fine writing a deaf character because I have real problems with my own hearing, and so. It, we've sold the film rights, and both mm. uh, Reggie and Aikaia don't say much, mm, and no, one of them no. speaks with his hands. Mm. So it's going to be interesting casting two actors who've got almost no lines. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. But, yeah, thought... yeah, I like that. The holy child, sort of. Yeah, he's a bit of a holy child. Yeah, isn't a magical. He's a catalyst. Yeah, yeah, um... yeah. perceptive. Yeah. and uh, and the way him and Aikaia. Uh, immediately uh, connect. Yes, that's yeah. right. He has a friend. Yes, he has a friend, and they they, they speak across time mm-hmm. and speak across languages and so on. Um, but also, your description of the place, it, it's like another Eden a, a bit. Mm. Again, it, I'm afraid it did slightly remind me of Walcott. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, <laughs> what? Get off that subject. <laughs> 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 it's really good. I'd read it. Um, but you know, it's it's got this sort of 
it, as I say, hedonic feeling, as if there's a sort of religious myth behind the book. Is that going too I far? I have to think that about that one, because I wrote it as a Buddhist man, and I'm like, no, I don't think there's no Christianity in it. Maybe there is, I don't know. Mm. Um, is there Christianity? Gosh. Perhaps not literally. I'm not but sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I no? don't know. No, it's fine. You're the writer, I just read it. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's particularly... Well, the thing is, is that the people of Black Honch are Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they pray to God and sing hymns. Yeah, yeah. And the non-Christians might be Rastafarian, mm. who are a different, you know, thing altogether. Mm, God. But I, no, not really. Because <laughs> okay, yeah. we were talking about the fact that I think the reason why this book has done better than the other books I've written the other is five because books written. I put it yeah. down to being a bit of a Buddhist these days. Huh. Well, more than a bit. So Probably say something about, so what, how, what, what, I was going to ask you that in our second half, we're going to have a second half, just I've forgotten to mention that, um, <laughs> I was going to ask you that in my second half, but let's ask it in the first half. So what, why is Buddhism, what, what, how has Buddhism got into the novel then? And what, what does being a Buddhist mean to you and how has it, how has it got into the novel? Oh, well, I don't think it's just about getting into the novel, I think, I think writers can be terribly ego-obsessed narcissists who are trying to write about themselves all the time. Mm. Doesn't mean and any I, of you. I know that I've done a lot of writing about myself, and this book is not about me. Mm. And there is something about meta here. There's mm. something about um, something really, really kind and simple about Aikaiya. Not mm. simple as in simple, but there's something mm. centrally. I think I've always thought about. You know, when I get stuck, when I got stuck with that book, I was always like, you know, find my heart, you know, get, get bed down deep, you know, what, what do I, what am I really thinking about here? Where are they, where are these characters really going? Mm. Um, <clears throat> definitely a shift in consciousness. It's a peaceful book. Mm, it is, yeah. 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 And is the mermaid connected with Buddhism for you somehow? No, I don't think so. Mm. Not a Buddhist thing, is it? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> like an umbrella. <laughs> or a parasol or a... Perhaps say a little bit. We'll, we'll, come, we'll yeah. come and get you to read some more of the novel and then we'll have a cup of tea in a minute. But say a little bit more about how you got involved in Buddhism because mm. I think you're our first guest at Poetry East who's actually... We've had lots of guests who say they're influenced by Buddhism but not many who say that they're a Buddhist. So oh. how did you, you, know, how did you make that journey? Because you, know? well, you were dr- brought up as a Catholic, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, so I think it, for me, it's taken about a decade to get even here to be able to say I'm a Buddhist. I am comfortable with saying that these days. Even though there are some ragged ends, there are definitely lots of questions still. And um, uh, I, so I came to meditate. I did a course here about 10 years ago. Yeah. And it was Subhadramati and Diabhadra. Hmm. And weirdly then I just found meditation I just like took to it really quickly really easily yeah. and I loved it and then I came and sat here I was allowed into the big room and <laughs> I used to sit in the front right there because mm. I was so deaf and I used to stare at whoever used to speak and lip read and take notes mm. do you remember? yeah I remember yeah. <laughs> I remember having to move and, you sometimes um, and ask loads of questions yeah. and like you know <laughs> Taking questions, notes, you know, on therapy. I've been in, I was in psychoanalysis as well. And I was always trying to work out, you know, Jung and the Buddha and always had loads of questions. But I never, never, ever, ever thought for a minute that I could be a Buddhist because I was a Catholic. Hmm. You don't, un, you don't get to lose, you don't get to de Catholic, you don't, do, can't do it. You're done. Once, once a Catholic, always done. a Catholic. The Pope has basically sealed you, you know, got his ring and gone boom. <laughs> like when you're a baby, it's like that, you've been branded. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I like these Buddhists and I, I like I like this, it's great, everything's great. But I can't be one because I'm a, I, you don't get to, you don't, it's like, you know, it's like that. I don't know if anybody here gets this. Like my mother, I can't even begin to tell you what my mother says about being a Buddhist. It's like you know, she takes the piss, as I said. But so my grandmother, you know, my mother, my nonna, the Italian Catholics that go back and I'm from the global south, you know, you don't become a Buddhist very easily when mm. you have that kind of a traditional 
like lineage of going back, you know. It's like it's like doing something like cra- like really wrong. Mm. Mm. I don't know does anybody does anybody get this? A few nods. A few nods. Yeah, mm. so it was quite hard so I just used to sit there for like years mm. and listen to the listen to the dharma and listen and listen and listen. And then I'll bloody hell one day okay. I'll volunteer or something, or I'll, I'll, I'll be a Mitra. I'll try that. <laughs> what does Mitra mean? It went mean? disastrously wrong. Did it, yeah. <clears throat> no, it didn't. But, you know, I sort of thought, oh, bloody hell, okay, I'll try this. And why it, did you try fine. it? I'm good. I'm why did you try it? Because I just, I don't know why I did it eventually. Eventually, I don't know why I did it. And when I did my Mitra ceremony, it was almost as if I it was being ordained at that point. I thought, this is the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. And I was like, you know, prostrate, you know, kneeling and doing all this. I was like, oh, oh my God, something's, this is like so crazy. And it still is. It still is kind of like crazy. So the mitra ceremony, ceremony just, in to, just in case you don't know, what mitra <coughs> ceremony means, it means it's when you publicly say that you're a Buddhist and you're a Buddhist within this particular tradition, yeah? So you make offerings in front of yeah. a shrine, in front of a whole room of people. And it, for me, it was like, that's it, I'm ordained. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't imagine, I can't imagine what being ordained... I mean, I mean to me, I think, you know, just... It would be, it'd all be a bit... It would be a lot. Hmm. But, um, so... And, like, my mum now, she's like... Are you going to shave your head? You know, what are you doing? Look at these... And, and so she... We once saw these on CNN proper like Tibetan Buddhists in their robes. Not that not, we're not proper. But you know, a sangha of male Buddhists in their robes with their shaven heads. And she, she went, what are you doing? How could you? You know, who do you think you are? These are not your people. So I've, it's been a really long journey. It's been a conversion that's taken a decade. And, and I feel so much happier. I'm really so much calmer. And like, Catholics are so dramatic. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just wrong. They're wrong about everything. And, um, <laughs> they, uh, but it's, it's also a bit like, it, like when you've been trained to think in a binary way and constantly carry a judge on your shoulder and think about good and bad and right or wrong and heaven and hell and all this stuff. And God, there's so much to do with it all. Um, and it starts to fall away, and it starts mm. to really, like armor, like starts to fall away, mm. and then you start to think like like the Buddha and the Buddhist do. It's like oh my god, mm. you know, it's like oh, you know, it's like retraining, um, it's like resetting, you know, re- a reset, mm. Mm. and so it's like unspooling uh, forty odd years of conditioning. Mm. And the conditioning of my grandmother and my mm. mother and all the Catholics that have ever lived and all of that terrible... A lot of us. All of it, all that guilt. <laughs> and then trying to reset and in a way that just is... Oh, okay. Mm. Now I... And so when I think about the novel, and you say, why is it a Buddhist novel? Mm. It's from... It's a, I think it's the first time I've written anything where I've been like, oh, I think... I've got right thinking. I think right now you know, right views and right ideas. And for the first time in my life, it's like, oh, I've got my head screwed on properly. Mm. Um, whereas before it was just like, you know, I don't know what I was thinking about. I think, well, like many Catholics, um, I was secular. Mm. I had stopped being a Catholic. Mm. Mm. It's hard to be a Catholic. Mm. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. Sorry. It's a great answer. <laughs> so let, listen, it, yeah. go on. Do you want yeah, to say no, something? Well, I mean, I think really interesting... So I don't know if you, any of you found this, but um, whenever I talk about Buddhism, people seem to think it was invented in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, people have been meditating for thousands of years, thousands and thousands, like, yeah. you know, in caves and things. And um, I think it's, what's interesting is, is that it's thousands of years old, but it's so for today, mm. mindfulness. Mm. And so you see a lot of secular mindfulness everywhere we go. And that's interesting. You don't see a lot of... Catholicism everywhere you go, do you? Mm. <laughs> 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 so it's a long time. And I, I, obviously, I live with Ange. And I'm so envious, and, and I feel a huge amount of like, I'm not quite sure if envy is the right way, but I, you know, oh, when I see younger people, 
under 25 and under 30, and they're like, you know, they come to Buddhism. I'm just like, <laughs> very lucky. Yeah, that's great. Anyway. Listen, we're going to talk more in, uh, after a tea break, but let's hear a bit more of the book, because it'd be good to have more of the book. Right. We've only had, a, only had a paragraph so far. <laughs> you know. I don't get me, yeah, I'll just do a little bit. And then we'll hear some more in the second half. We'll have a, so we'll hear some more, then we're going to have a cup of tea, and then I've got a few more searching questions, and then we'll hear a bit more. Okay, so, th- so, so there's been this big fishing competition, and some Americans have come down to catch themselves like really big fish, and they're out there on their boat with some local men who are crew, and they've caught something. And they, they haven't worked, they know that there's something big that they've, they've snagged, but they don't know what it is. So they, now they get to see what they've caught. That thing's about to come up, shouted the father. Son of a goddamn, it's coming up. Keep your rod up. The flat dark sea broke open. Then the mermaid rose up and out of the water, her hair flying like a nest of cables, and her arms flung backwards in a jump, and her body glistening with scales and her tail flailing, huge and muscular, like that of a creature from the deepest part of the ocean. She beat up and out, arcing through the air so that she flipped on her back, and the men saw her head and her breasts, her belly, and the pubic bone of a woman where it met the tail of a glistening fish. Can I say Jesus Christ? Yeah, I think so. Jesus <laughs> Christ! In a swear word way. Jesus Christ! Exclaimed Thomas Clayson. Nice across himself. The black conch boys gasped. Cut the line! shouted Nicer Country. Cut the goddamn line! All five men were horrified as she hit the water, thrashing. Her mouth was bloody and she'd only just started to fight when the end of Hank Clayson's rod was a wild creature, furious to be caught. Nyssa knew they'd hook something they shouldn't have, and he jumped down from the flight bridge with his knife. The mermaid, or whatever it was, deserved to stay in the sea. This wasn't his business at all. The thing looked too big for the boat. It could even take the boat down. Don't do that, shouted Thomas Clayson, as Nyssa bent to cut the line. Do not do that. She's worth millions. Millions. And we're bringing her in. God damn it, we are bringing her in. She was on the surface now, thrashing like a mako shark, fighting the line with her arms and coughing up blood and spitting and screaming a high wailing song. Oh God, stammered Frank. Did you see that? His hands were shaking on the rod. The father wanted to take it from him. The black conch men, Nicholas and Shortleg, backed away from the stern. Like nicer, they knew this was wrong and they frayed a bad jumpy fish get catch. They didn't want to help. They were lost for words and what to do. The white men wanted to pull this creature out of the sea. But this fish was half woman, plain enough. Everyone had heard of the mermen um, stories in black conch waters. But a merwoman? Nah. She carried with her bad luck at best, and her hair had frightened them, like she could kill with just one lash from those tentacles. She could poison them all. And they'd seen spikes on her back, dorsal spikes, scorpion fish spikes. They had seen a bloody raging woman on the end of the fishing line. And now these white men, they wanted to pull her in? Nah! (coughs) Nah, boy, they all said to themselves. This mermaid was going under the surface again. And the younger Clayson's face was full of terror and excitement. Hold her, shouted the father. What does it look like I'm doing? The son snapped. Keep backing up onto it, Thomas Clayson shouted to Nyssa. Nyssa had begun to see dollar signs. If it had been him alone, he would have thrown her back in the sea. But the talk made him realise that he could make enough money for another boat, or a car, or a small business of his own. The engine hummed. Nyssa could feel his... Oh, hang on. Blah, blah, blah. The line stopped going out. The younger Clayson was lifting and lowering his rod, lifting and lowering, and the line was coming back onto the reel as fast as he could turn the reel handle. The mermaid had gone back under for now. That thing must weigh like 600 pounds, said Thomas Clayson. The ocean was flat and empty again, and there was silence apart from the sound of the reel ticking over. Did you see her? said Hank Clayson. Hell yes, said the father. Did you see her tits? (laughs) said the son. 
He was so entranced by what he caught, it had loosened his tongue. Hell yes! Did you see your face? Yes. Did you see your arms? Yes. Did you see her pussy bone? All the men nodded at this. We could sell her to the Smithsonian, to the Thomas Clayson, or the Rockefeller Institute for research. The line was slowly coming in, and for the next 20 minutes, the men stared hard astern, each calculating what might happen if they caught her, and each feeling a deep, boiling up sensation in his groin. They didn't know what to expect. They kept their eyes on the sea and listened to the real ticking. She was coming in, but she would fight again. <laughs> That's great. So let's have a, uh, we'll go next door and have a cup of tea, and then we'll come back in and I've got some more questions and we'll hear some more from the Mermaid of Black Conch. Yeah, just welcome Monique back to the stage. Come and join me again. <laughs> So I wanted to start with a more difficult question for the second phrase. Um, don't relax. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned right at the start there's a very strong sense of place in, in, in the uh, Mermaid of Black Conch. And it's a, a, a strong sense of place, troubled, as you said, and complicated by you know, the, the, the whole questions of race and so on. And at one point you talk about a character as a white woman with a Creole song in her, in her mouth. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what it, what, what's the experience of being a white woman in the Caribbean, yeah, uh, in Trinidad? Yeah. Um, what, what, what happens? How's that for you? You know, you, you know, mm. you might say something about yeah. your, how you, how you came to be in Trinidad. Yeah, there's lots to say about all of this because even though. Um, white people in the region are 1%, so it's a small percentage. Even that 1% is very, very aggrated. So um, there is a kind of archetype of the Caribbean white person who is an ex-planter. Um, and these people still exist, they're still around, and often, um, they can't leave. They can't leave because they they're, they're Caribbean people. Mm. Um, so Miss um, mm. Rain comes from that type of white person. Um, I don't. I don't. Um, but my father arrived in the fifties. My parents arrived before independence, and they came. They were colonial people. They came mm. um, with. Um, they were innocent when they came. Um, and so Caribbean white people, this, I, again, I'm just going to speak for myself here. I, I, I know very well that I come from an ex-colonized space and what that means. Um, whether it's um, the experience of place. So um, we have places all over the region, all over Trinidad, that literally say this is where... Um, there was a massacre, or this is where um, there was a plantation, or that is a plantation there. Um, I could talk a lot about, like, so for example, my parents bought land in the 60s and uh, on an old cocoa estate. Hmm. They chopped down an immortel tree, which was there to shade the cocoa and the workers hmm. for their swimming pool. Hmm. So. Again, you'd have to be really n not tuning in at all um, to, what, and if you're white, you would you really really understand history, the history of the place, mm. and your position, my positionality, to as a white person, um, to the crimes committed by people that look like me, um, and the and there are all kinds of um, ways people cope with that. Um, some white people don't cope well and some make art and write books and some pretend, I don't know, there's just a lot of strangeness around Caribbean white people. Um, 
I know some really interesting Caribbean white people and I know some very problematic Caribbean white people and it's a really tough one to square up to mm. um, and, I, and a lot of Caribbean white writers have all written the same book we've all written a book um, about why we're there mm. I've written one a lot mm. of my other friends have all written the same like what do we do who are we and what are we doing here why are mm. we still here mm. Mm. so it's a different so I, again, about this innocence, you know, so um, I'm bicultural and binational. So my white friends here, especially women, or just say my white female friends here, why would they know hmm. what I know? They're not in the minority. They are never got taught about our colonising British... Uh, involvement in slavery so why would white people here know what I know mm. I know what I know because I'm from a place where it all happened mm. um, deeply uncomfortable and it's I would say so I my brother is married to a woman who family had plant plantations and so on the one, on while I would say not every white Caribbean person has a plantation background, a lot do, hmm. and then it's deeply, deeply uncomfortable hmm. to live with that. Hmm. Um, but if you, as a writer, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's something to think about. Hmm. Hmm, yeah, of course. and. Um, you know, you when we were when we were meeting, you were you were saying that you you know you had more an accent when you were young. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps tell us a little bit about you know your your then, then you went to a conference school like yeah, Miss yeah. Rain does in the. So um, uh, when my parents, so this is a process called of a creolization, which happens to every single person who comes to Trinidad and stays. And so the word Creole could be a brown Creole or a black Creole or a white Creole, you know. Mm. There's a sort of, it's a kind of fusion, a word that denotes fusion. Mm. And so my family have Creolized over like two or three generations. So my brother has really white children and they speak Trinidadian English. They speak with a Caribbean uh, accent. Mm. And so does my brother. And... When I was younger, it was it was happening to me too. I did have a strong Caribbean accent, and um, <clears throat> my parents sent me to school in this country, and it was a real problem. It was like you know, it was like, why are you speaking with a black person's voice? You know, <laughs> do it again. Say something. Say something. You know, ha ha ha. You know, and I was only about thirteen or fourteen, and I remember thinking. What am I going to do about the way I speak? You know, I'm going to have to, I have to think this, think about this, and eventually, and every time I went back for like a summer holiday, it would come. I'd come back in September with this like strong Trini accent. Mm. They'd be like, "You're doing it again. You're doing it again. Ha ha ha! <laughs> Say something." And I remember thinking, "Nah, I've got to make up my mind about this. I've got to work out how I'm going to get by if I'm and speak English proper English." My father spoke in, you know standard English mm. so I kind of lost it but I kind of get it back when I go home as well mm. Mm. and I write it very comfortably I write Caribbean uh, Trini mm. English very comfortably so um, so I had I kind of was creolizing and then had to decreolize in order to fit in here and of course it's quite trendy now Trinidadians have a wonderful uh, accent it's the sexiest accent in the world <laughs> some people say but I've lost mine but um, it's trendy now, but when I was younger, you know, this is 20... And I, talk, I talk a lot about race, actually, and I talk a lot about race with mixed-race women and black women, and I'm like, well, when, I'm 57. Um, we have the internet now, we have social media, so, like, conversations are happening um, that only used to happen in, like, academia. Um, and when I was younger, we didn't talk about anything. You just used to... If you're light enough, you're white, you just get on with it. Mm. turn off the accent try and be mm. normal you know yeah, we didn't have conversations about identity when I was younger mm. you just you just didn't you know so I think it's a really good thing now that people are because there's so much nuance to it all mm. yeah mm. Mm. great
Good to hear. Let, let's see. Hey, why don't we have a bit more of the novel? Let's, huh? Shall we? Uh, read some more. Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I want to make sure we keep on going back into okay. the novel. Yeah. So, the, so she's rescued by a fisherman. And um, he thinks he's just going to chop her down. She's been lynched up on the jetty. And he thinks, I'm just going to chop her down, get her in a wheelbarrow, take her home, and then tomorrow night I'm going to put her back in the sea. Yeah. But that doesn't happen. So because she starts to unravel quite quickly. Um, and he ends up with uh, re-metamorphosizing. Is that, was that a word? A, a, a mermaid coming back to being a woman. Okay, so this is from his journal that he's writing retrospectively. Three days she stayed in that tub watching me. I began to think it was a bad idea to try and save her. She started to change back, quick, quick, maybe even from the time she was first captured or strung up on that jetty. Some things start to happen to her. She began to reverse. And then I understood she was not one of God's half designs. She was something else. The mermaid was coming back to woman, and a woman from another time. I didn't know how long ago, but long. She had markings on her shoulders, tattoos. They looked like spirals, and the spirals looked like the moon and the sun. I guess she was a woman from the tribes that lived in these islands, when everything was still a garden. And I saw her enormous silver tail begin to come apart. It looked very old and dark. I was scared it might fall off, the end part at least. She watched me for three days straight. I tried to make everything feel safe. My dog Harvey helped me too. Normally he didn't like anyone but me. He should have been jealous of her, but instead he seemed to know she needed guarding. <coughs> he sat and watched her, her day and night, and they watched each other like they were talking. Mm. And the hook remained in her throat but she wouldn't let me near her face. She had a bad look in her eyes. Her top half of her scaly shark skin was peeling off in thin sheets. It was like she was emerging from hiding, like one of those mummies in Egypt. I could tell she was scared, that she didn't know what was happening. I think she wasn't expecting this changing back, and she wouldn't eat. I tried everything. Shrimps, fish heads, lettuce, nothing. Her eyes leaked all the time and the fishing line trailed from her mouth. I thought I'd made a big mistake. By then, I couldn't put her back into the sea, not in that condition, and I wondered what I could do with her now she was here in my house. And at night, she moaned, long, mournful sound, like somebody dying a lonely death. And in the day, she sat still in the tub and she watched me. And I tried everything I could think of. I hosed her down. I put more salt in the bath. I tried singing to her with my guitar, but she really didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> this time, she didn't want no music. No sweet man with no dread singing her hymns. None of that. Then one day I was eating a small fig banana and I catch her watching me hard. She was interested for the first time. And I offered it to her. She stared at it. And I went close and I said, Here you are, Dudu. Fresh, sweet big for you, my lady. She took it from my hand and she bit into it careful to avoid hurting her throat. And she was watching me while she eat the whole damn thing. And she wiped her mouth with her hand. She watched me again. And I picked up the whole hand of fig bananas and I knelt by the tub and I broke off one and gave it to her. And she took that too. She peeled it and ate it. I could see the hook was stuck up in her throat. The piece of line was dangling from the corner of her mouth. She wouldn't let me touch her face. And I wondered what she was thinking and how she was coping. How could I help this half and half? For that was what she was. I could see she used to be a woman. And this was what, she was, what was coming back. Her hands, they were the first to change. The webbing fell off in clumps, like grey pink jello, to the floor. I cleaned it up. Her hands underneath were brown and dainty like. I thought she must be coming back to her old self. Shall I continue? Yeah. Yeah. After that success, I tried more fruit, 
and it was mango season, so I bring her a pile of starch mangoes from the neighbour's backyard. She ate them in one go. And she liked sapodilla, too. And I fed her half of watermelon in thick slices. Soon around the tub there was a litter of fruit skins and pieces of her old self. The nest of sargassum seaweed in her hair began to fall off in clumps, and underneath was long black knotted dreads. Her ears dripped seawater, and small insects climbed out. Her nostrils bred all kinds of mollusks and tiny crabs. She'd been a home to all kinds of small creatures, and they were slowly over days abandoning her and moving out. Small piles appeared by the side of the tog, and these piles were active. Crabs scuttled away sideways. I had to shoo away the neighbour's cat, which came sniffing around. I gave her water too, every day, lots of it from the tap in a jug, and she'd drink that back greedy for fresh water. It was like a game of test and try, to see what she might like. I knew her throat would soon go bad, infected, if the hook wasn't removed. But still I couldn't get near her. Who in hell was she? And what was her name? And who did she even, and did she even have a name? And who had she been? And where had she come from? And I wondered if she would run away the minute she could, or try to swim home. And one day I woke up early and I found her tail on the floor. It was off completely. Large and ragged and smelling not too good. I looked at her and she looked at me and I swear I saw that she was upset, maybe even miserable, to lose it. It was like when snakes shed their skin. She was shedding herself, with a part of herself that was fish. I put the fish tail in a garbage bag, and I put the bag in the trash can at the back of the house, wrapped up well so the cats couldn't get at it. After that, I kept watch. The dorsal came off next. The spikes on her back had been dissolving, and they came off the next day, all in a row, like a long spine from the back of a dinosaur, all in one, her sail. It had begun to rot and turn gelatinous. I'm going to stop there. Hmm. I mean, there's a good, really good sense of how real the mermaid feels in, in novels. Um, that goes all the way through the novel. There's the, 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 a very strong sense of her reality. Um, I haven't got anything to say about that, but it's very striking, isn't it? Mm. Uh, don't know, do you get that from the, you know, it, I was so pleased it wasn't a, a metaphor. I, I was so pleased it wasn't, it was a mermaid, you know, I wanted to, yeah. one of the exciting things about the novel is actually meeting a mermaid, and you've made a, a mermaid, if you see, for, out of your imagination. I, mean, I really like that. I thought we'd just say, we'll, we'll, I want to talk to you in a moment about what you're writing now, but um, I was just wondering, you know, what did it, how has winning, winning cost a book of the year? Which is quite a thing to win. It's, it's interesting. Ha- Hannah Lowe has just won yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this year. So we've interviewed yeah, both yeah. You know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. last year's winner and this year's winners. We've had yeah, a poetry. Fantastic. Obviously. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but you know, how, did, how did it... Well, obviously it would be exciting, but do you think it's affected you as a writer? What's it done uh, for no, you? I hope not. Um, so first of all, I don't know if any of you... There's a really crazy story attached to the publication of this book. I don't know. Yeah. It's a really, really yeah. good story. It's a great story. <laughs> I'll just tell you... I'll tell it... Try me as quick as possible. So it's a complicated book. It's told in verse, and it, a, mermaid, a mermaid verse, and mm. then uh, letters, and then it's also written in a lot of Creole language. It's, you could say it's on the experimental end <coughs> of, like, you know, writing. So when we took it out to sell it, um, it was rejected by every single mainstream publisher. So mm. nobody wanted to buy it. Mm. It's terrible. Mm. And um, it happens. It happens to. It's su- such a common story with writers. Mm. And and I was like, you know, I've been writing for a while, and it wasn't a good sign. It really wasn't a good sign. Mm. It's like you know, mm. <laughs> curtains for me. Mm. And um, so I was like, okay, I get that, okay, damn, you know. But um, People Tree Press, who are a very established uh, black British Caribbean uh, independent press, who knew me and who I know them, and they're very much part of the Caribbean uh, literary world, 
and they had published almost every big Caribbean writer and poet in the last 40 years. So they, they, they wanted to publish a book. <coughs> so I was thrilled. Mm. I was thrilled. I thought, great, this is, this is good. This is good, you know. I won't swear, but I could swear at the mainstream. So, um, so we went, so, but they had no budget for publicity or anything like that. Most independent presses are really, really operating on a, shoestr on a shoestring budget. So I thought to myself, I'm never going to be able to publish another novel. No one wants, nobody wants me. <laughs> and oh, it's over, my career is over, and you know. But I really want this book to be read and seen. Mm. So I spoke to a really, really uh, famous writer I know. And I said, I think I'm going to crowdfund for a publicist. What do you think? And she said, never do that, it's awful, it's embarrassing and you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And I was like, and I was like, okay. Um, but I did, I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> and I raised lots of money for a publicist back in 2019, long before COVID. And then some friends came on board who um, do tours for writers and they got some Arts Council money for me. So in uh, early 2020, I thought to myself, okay, Rofi, this is your last book you're ever going to write. It's over now. Go home. But you have got some Arts Council money, so you'll go on tour, and you have got a really good publicist, and mm. so you've got a chance. There's a chance. There's a mm. like fighting chance mm. that mm. my book's going to like get out there, and like it's got like jet fighters with like wing. You know, we're, we're out there. <laughs> And um, it was published in April, in the middle of the first wave of COVID-19. Mm. And not a single person in the world was interested in a mermaid. No one cared. No one's interested. I get that. It's awful. <laughs> and, and not just me. There was a few of us all being published in April 2020. And it was a disaster. Mm. A complete disaster for publishing. And really interesting things happened. Um, because... A lot of really big name writers could see what was happening to people being published in April. Mm. And so they kind of like came to our rescue. Mm. So um, David Nichols, do you know who he is? He writes, he's a big TV writer. No. And then Bernadine Evaristo and a few mm. others, Nikita Gill, all kinds of people like 50, 60,000 Twitter followers or something. Mm. They were like launching, our, launching for us. It was a really mm. nice story. It's really mm. nice. Mm. But anyway, cut a long story short, by the end of 2020, I was like, it's over. You know, sold a couple of hundred copies, mm. 500 copies of I'm Lucky. Mm. Maybe a that, I don't know, a thousand copies. But it was over, you know, COVID, much bigger thing. Book can't survive, publishing world in the toilet, you know, mm. my career over. Then I won this huge prize. <laughs> <laughs> so it's huge. It was, I mean, I was flabbergasted for weeks and months. I'm still flabbergasted. I was just like, hmm. and I was on my own because I've got really bad asthma and autoimmune immune problems. So I was shielding. And it was before the vaccine. And I can't tell you when, you know, it's like something really big happens. Hmm. And there was like literally no no one here you know like people mm. run out into the street mm. no party no drunken get together at whatever you know nothing mm. so um it was huge and it is a big thing to win especially you know being in the situation i was in and um i'm very grateful it's amazing we've sold a hundred thousand copies now and it's mm. going to be a film and mm. all over the world and Everybody likes a book. Everyone, everyone, <laughs> everybody wants a mermaid. It's a book that nobody wanted huh. and everybody rejected as a book that everybody likes. Mm. Mm. It's incredible. Fantastic. It's a great story to tell, especially other right. I mean, all my friends, so many of my friends, you know, you, you get to a certain age and you're writing still. It's like, God, you know, it's mm. hard to keep going. Mm. Yeah, of course, of course. So what are you writing now? Because you are writing now, because we you told me. I am. Me. <laughs> I am writing a book. I'm yeah. I'm writing a book about um, a woman who was murdered in Trinidad five years ago, and I'm writing about a kind of crazy feminist revolution that never happened. And I'm having. I, I am thinking to myself, um, you know, do you ever have that? You know, you sort of dream something up. I'm, I'm writing about a crazy feminist coup d'état in Trinidad and um, 
which ends on Good Friday with an earthquake, I think. And then, um, and there's lots of characters that are all, it's called the harrowing, mm. the harrowing of hell. And you thought there might be even a Buddhist character. No, no there is a Buddhist character. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, an, apt, there's an actual Buddhist character in this yeah, book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems right to have a Buddhist character for a Buddhist there's a writer. Definite, but there's a Buddhist character who has a brother who's a gangster. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, That's just an everyday a, uh, Buddhist yeah. thing, you know. I'm, so I'm judging the Orwell Prize at the moment for political fiction. I'm reading a lot of political books. And I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm reading mm. a lot of really very, very pointedly feminist books and very, very pointedly. And it's making me think about whether or not it, these are books that people like to read. I'm not mm. sure. Mm. Interesting. So like, why don't we just finish with another reading? Have you got anything? Can you read another some more? Reading? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I yeah. don't know what to read now. <laughs> Yeah, anything you like in particular? Well, so about, about Miss Rain. How about oh. the first time we meet Miss Rain? Uh, do you I like did, her? I liked Miss Rain. What do you like about her? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interviewing you. <laughs> What's good about her? She's got spirit, hasn't she? Yeah, she's complicated. Yeah, she's complicated, but she's got spirit. Yeah, you know. she's the boss, though. Yeah, but she's, she's got spirit. Planter. Yeah, but she's all right. But people, yeah, she's OK. Yeah. <laughs> There's no blame in the book. I like that. There was no blame in the book. There's, there's the realities, and, you know, it, it, there's this whole back story, a terrible back story, but there's no blame in it, I didn't think. She's part of things. Um, and she's respected, isn't she? She's what? She's respected. She's affected. No, it's respected. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm dead. laughs> she didn't strike me as affected she's, at all. I thought you said she's sexy or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot of sexiness in the book, we won't go there. <laughs> it's a very sensual and sexy book, isn't it? It's quite sexy. Yeah, yeah. Not as sexy as the other ones I've written. <laughs> okay, I've got a good ad. <laughs> Wait, hang on. I don't, you should have told me I, was, I should have told you <laughs> to do this. Where am I David? I, I didn't know I was going oh, to. Oh, wait, wait. Shall I just tell you about Miss Rain? Okay. Shall I tell you about Miss Rain? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So Miss Rain owns the village. What do you find? Can you find it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell us so about Miss Rain. Miss Rain owns the village. And in fact, she's reading In a Green Night. Yes, that's right. That's, that's why yeah, I, yeah, that's she's reading In a Green Night. Um, it's written by Derek Walsh. So <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there again. <laughs> um, so, when, so when you say Eden... So a part of Tobago. Anyone been to Tobago? I've been. Or Trinidad? Huh? Yeah, exactly. Ago, so Tobago's like a, a, a cigar, and the tip, the northern tip, is privately owned by a woman who, a landowner, a white landowner, and who is extremely well known and respected and liked, and an environmentalist, and she owns a lot, a lot of land, a lot. And I spoke to her recently. I was like, God, <laughs> what's she going to think of my book? She's like, I love it. She <laughs> says, I can recognise a character, uh, the old lady up on the hill with the peacocks. And I was like, yeah, yeah. She said, That's me, isn't it? And I was like, <laughs> kind of. Not really. <laughs> 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 oh, God. Oh, God, it was a moment. Anyway, I said, you've heard about this book, haven't you? Yes, it's fun. I love it. Um, anyway, so, but the woman, they're not the same people. They're not the same person. But the idea being, and so she doesn't charge anyone rent. People, everybody, she owns everything. She owns everything. She owns the land, she owns the houses, she owns this, that, everything. But she doesn't... People pay her what they can, if they can, and sometimes they don't pay her at all. Mm. And a lot of, I have another friend who owns a very big piece of land, like the whole of, you know, northwest Trinidad, and he's the same thing. He's like, you can't get people to, you know, I own this land, and people start building their house, and what am I going to go and tell them? You can't build your house there? You know, it's a big thing, um, and people don't pay him either. Mm. And he doesn't, you know, what do, what do you do? They're mm. not... 
so so I think there's something about what's left of these big white landowners um, and their nuanced, complicated relationship to owning land, to um, being part of uh, a place, uh, uh, marrying into people locally so they have black, brown children and lovers and friends, colleagues. And it's not this stereotype that you come across again and again and again mm. in a book, for example, like the Wide Sargassi, you know, mm. they say when trouble come, close ranks. And so the white people did, mm. you know, it's all about the end of, um, well, the, well, it's about emancipation and the end of slavery in the middle of the 19th century. So this is why I kind of wrote Miss Rain because I'm slightly bored of this kind of white, crazy white woman, um, landowning kind of plantocracy who's kind of gone a bit mad. Mm. That's not, I know people who are very different to that mm. and they're, relation, they're part of things, they're, mm. part, they're mixed up into the whole thing. Mm. And of course the land they own is cursed. It's a historic baggage, it's historically cursed. Mm. So, um, God, I could talk, I've been filmed. But so, uh, so Miss Rain has come, oh, you, you found it. Only there, yeah? Yeah. Oh. Yes. First okay. Appeared. So Miss Rain is a kind of sexy younger version of the woman I know. <laughs> <laughs> Although the peacocks, still got the peacocks. And she has peacocks, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like the peacocks. And, and, then, and so in the northern part of Tobago, it's quite cool because she hasn't cut any trees down. It's literally, you could almost, I mean, like in most of Trinidad, it's like 30 something degrees every day. And in the, this part of Tobago, it's like 26 degrees, 27 degrees, like a, like a summer day in England, maybe. Mm. And because she hasn't chopped any trees down, it's like there are no big hotels, none. Mm. There's not even, there's nothing. It's like how the Caribbean was like 50 years ago, and she's mm. literally protected it. Mm. Mm. So um, it's this, this book is set in the 70s. Hang on. Oh, she meets the Reggie. Okay, hang on a sec. Yeah. In time, the news reached up the hill to Miss Arcadia Rain. Her cousin Cece phoned her about the bacchanal on the foreshore, about the mermaid that had appeared and then disappeared, and the reward for her return, and then about this new merman, Arnold. Oh, this is another thing that happened. So, sorry. Yeah. Down on the foreshore, there's a fish depot, which is true, and... So it's a story I heard about they cut the head off a marlin and a man literally stuck it on his head hmm. and turned himself into a merman and was running around. Hmm. So this is what's happened. Hmm. Arnold had stuck his, the fish head on his head. Um, Miss Rain, okay. Yeah, so Miss Rain arrived in her old Land Rover Jeep with her son Reggie. He had on his favourite aviator sunglasses and his hair greased into knots. Miss Rain only ever came down to the foreshore in St Constance if she had to. She mostly lived on her own up in the green up in the great house, where she played the piano and read books. A lot of the fishing boats had already gone out for the day, hoping already got out for the day, day two of the competition. Some of them left exciting, hoping to recatch the mermaid, and the old man Thomas Clayson went back out but with different crew paid double. This time he swore he'd bring her back dead. The son, Hank, refused to go out again. He'd been nursing a tabanka for the mermaid, the first woman, woman he'd ever hooked, well and true. And now she was gone, vanished, as magically as she had appeared. He knew he had photographs of her on his camera. That was actual proof, though they weren't really that well focused. His hands must have been shaking. But that morning, it was like the truth of her existence had already come into question. A mermaid that was there and then wasn't, was hardly convincing. The Dauntless crew had seen her, but now they disappeared. The men in the bar had seen her too, but they had quickly gotten drunk and most of them were still asleep. And anyway, who would believe a group of drunken fishermen who said they had seen a mermaid hanging by her tail on the jetty? Cece hadn't seen her, and nor had her cousin Priscilla, and nor had any of the women in the village. Had a bunch of drunken men made the whole story up? 
So Hank was relieved to see the white woman. He hailed down Miss Rain's jeep in something of a fervour, as if she might be able to call the mermaid back. Maybe, maybe Miss Rain had taken her or knew who had. He was anxious to tell her his story. He was still wearing his yellow t-shirt from the day before, sweat stained and bloodied, though you could still read its inscription, Fortune favours the bold. In this faraway Caribbean seaside village, Hank Clayson felt laughed at and out of his depth. He wanted to pack up his things and ditch the boat and fly back to Miami. His father had gone mad. He was an embarrassment at the best of times, and this was supposed to be a holiday, and now this. Miss Rain parked and got out of her jeep, and she walked towards the young American man, and her eyes were squinting to read his t-shirt. Hello, man, he said to her in his Florida drawl. I'm very pleased to meet you. Miss Rain gave him a look that said he needed a good wash and a shave and a good cut ass for getting her out of the bed so early in the, on a Sunday morning. What do you ask going on here, she said, ignoring his outstretched hands, stalking past him towards the jetty. She was in no mood for this, this stupid-looking young-ass Yankee fisherman to boot and his story of a mermaid and Arnold with his marlin spike stuck on his head. Hank soon found that Miss Rain was a hard woman to fathom. For a start, she spoke just like the local fisherman in that same slow, rhythmic, broken-down, backward English. Even though Hank Clayson had discovered she owned the place, at least all the land around, it was clear she hadn't been educated up. She was white, milk white, in fact, and the freckles had exploded across her face and her arms, so she looked a little bit like an Appaloosa pony. It was hard not to stare, but her hard green eyes flashed back, don't you even dare. And Miss Rain was small, with honey blonde curly hair, cut short like a boy's also clear that she was respected like some kind of mare. But when she opened her mouth, the same language flowed out. And this was a shock. She was like the black conch people, except white. Hank Clayson strode after her towards the jetty, towards Arnold, who was sitting on the end of it, still wearing the marlin spike on his head. Arnold, she spoke loudly. What the hell going on, eh? Arnold didn't answer. He was watching the sea, his legs dangling off the jetty. From behind, he looked like a merman, except in reverse. Arnold, take that blasted thing off your head! Arnold didn't respond. Arnold! She repeated, walking closer. Take that nasty fish head off your head right now! It's going to give you a bad case of a bacterial infection. Arnold couldn't hear her. The fish head had blocked his ears. Miss Rain stood above him, and she was wearing flat-heeled sandals and a flowery dress that day. The man was still staring at, her, at the sea in reverie. This time she didn't ask. She pulled the spike head, spiked head up, and it came off with a squelch. Arnold gave her a look as if to say, why the hell did she do that? Miss Rain, was, Miss Rain knew smart man Arnold. They had met many times before, and the truth was, he was probably a cousin three times removed. She squatted down on her flat heels and said, Look, the man, go wash yourself, OK? And stop troubling people. Arnold shrugged. He didn't need to behave in no particular way for nobody. He was bored. It was said he had once wanted to go to university to study to be a political scientist on a bigger island. And now he was a little crazy from too much ganja smoking and boredom. He liked to frighten people. Miss Rain had figured him out a long time. She'd even suggested he go to study, <coughs> and even offered some money to help. <clears throat> but he hadn't gone because of his ganja habit and because of his collection of caged birds. Arnold, she said, I know you, eh? Huh? And you know that. Don't waste your whole goddamn life making trouble, OK? One thing you keep yourself, your trouble to yourself. Whole other thing you make noise and trouble for everybody else, OK? I have some work for you, if you want it. Come and see me sometime, OK? Arnold nodded, but she knew he was indifferent to her bribe. Work? That man was too smart for that. OK, Miss Rain, I'll come up soon. He was lying. He would never come up. 
He was looking, for, he was looking after a good-sized crop of weed in the hills. A lot of fellows made their living the same way. St. Constance men grew weed <coughs> or fished the sea. Both the hills and the sea were abundant in their giving. I might stop there. Okay. Yeah, Thank stop. you. That's a great place to stop. So you've heard some of um, um, The Mermaid from Black Con, so do make sure you get a copy. There's also copies of uh, Monique's other novels in the bookshop, so do go get a coffee. And of co co coffee? A coffee? Um, and of course, Monique is very happy to sign, aren't you, Monique? Yeah, yeah so she's happy to sign. So do get, get a copy. And then do sign, if, if you're not on the mailing list, we'll have people from the team with um, a bit of paper to write your, mail, your email down and we'll put you onto the mailing list. As, as I said, the next guest is an online guest, Tracy K. Smith, um, the Pulitzer Prize African-American poet. And then I, after her, I think it's um, Jane Draycott and uh, Claudine Torduni. Um, then after them, it's um, Colin Toybin, I think, is the next one. And then Christopher Lebrun. And you've and got George Saunders coming. And we're going to have George Saunders coming as well point. at some point. He said yes, anyway. It's just a question of getting him in to the UK. He's a proper Buddhist writer. Yes, that's right. He's a, he's a wonderful Buddhist writer. But yes, yeah, so do join the main list, but do go and get uh, one of Monique's novels. You'll love it. Yeah, you'll really love it. So let's give Monique a, a round of applause. <laughs>